da, 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 da. Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, this is the first Monday of the month, which means it is McDougal Monday, where we are graced with the presence of both Dr. John and Mary McDougal. Dr. McDougal will be giving a brand new lecture on diabetes. But before I introduce Dr. McDougal, I also want to introduce some special guests. If you watch the show regularly, you know the last couple of times Dr. McDougal came on, we had people come on and give a testimonial to the work of Dr. McDougal, how his diet had changed their life and made them well. These are people that I didn't know that actually contacted me and said, can I please tell Dr. McDougal my story? And we're like, sure. Well, last time Dr. McDougal was on, he said, why don't you get Larry and Ann Weed on? They're almost 90 and they're doing great on the diet. So please welcome Larry and Ann Weed. Thank you so much for coming on. Hi, nice yeah, to be with our you. pleasure. With the two of you, yeah, yeah. you a long time and Dr. McDougal. Yeah, so you've known Dr. McDougal for years, and I and you, I mean, Larry, I can't believe you're going to be ninety. You look amazing, and I know you guys. You you have no cognitive decline, as far as I know. You're not on any medication or have any diseases. Tell us your story of how you found Dr. McDougal's work and how how long you've been McDougaling. McDougaling. Well. Um, in 77, we moved to Hawaii. We were transferred there. That was a tough assignment, <laughs> something we really enjoyed. And I'd had a series of problems, health problems, and they put me on medication. I'd have side effects from the medication. So they put me on another medication. It was just crazy. So I'm talking to a local gal. She said, there's a new doctor in town in Kailua. You might check with him. And it was John McDougal. And he had just, this was 1979, I think, that I met you, John. And you had just opened your office like a year before or close to that. And so I went in and what he said made sense to me. And um, so he showed me a video uh, and there was a room with all these items you can buy in the store, healthier versions and so forth. And so I stayed in touch with him even after we moved. We were only there five years. And so I'd met him in 79, we left in 82 and continued to stay in touch whenever we went back to Hawaii and was watching him progress and getting attention for the information he was doing. And um, I just, as I say, it made sense. No doctor had ever talked about diet before. And uh, so I appreciate all those years, John, we've stayed together and followed you, got every book, um, went on many of your trips. Um, I mean, gosh, I think you went on 38. I looked at my list of trips that we went on with you. And uh, th those- You, you were vacationed 38 times with Dr. McDougall? Um, close to that. I think he did 38 trips and we were on probably 32 or three of those. Um, many places, Alaska, Belize, Brazil, Costa Rica, either on a cruise ship or a hotel stay, Galapagos, Guatemala, Hawaii, Big Island and Kauai, um, Panama and Peru. I mean, we did it. <laughs> and of course, Costa Rica, we did many times, but it was enjoyable just to have that time with other people who were interested and hear John's lectures again. I mean, it wasn't all lectures. It was just one small part of the day that was a choice to listen to him and everybody went to hear him speak. But the adventures each day, we had an adventure uh, on all these countries that we went to. So it's been reinforced all along by hearing John. <laughs> he never gives up um, and we had great times. Lori, um, how long have you been following the McDougal diet and what difference has that made in your health? And in well, health? whenever John uh, convinced Anne she should be on a vegan diet. Um, he said, now, uh, you don't want to cook two different meals every night. So we've got to talk your husband into being a vegan. And so I spoke to John and I decided to go along with the program. Um, and uh, while we were in Hawaii, eating out wasn't uh, much of a problem because there's a lot of ethnic restaurants you know, they have Japanese, Chinese, Thai, Filipino, so forth. And they all have a page of vegetarian items on their menu. Um, the problem I had was that uh, for my job, I was traveling all over every place. And so 
I had special meal problems there uh, because when I would land, the uh, the program usually was they took me to the fanciest restaurant in town. And uh, so to cope with that, I uh, would find out in advance where we were going. And then I call up the restaurant and say, I need a special meal. I'm bringing important clients. I don't want to have a 30 minute conversation with the waiter. And uh, I was surprised at upscale restaurants, the chef would be very accommodative because uh, they were tired of cooking with what's on the menu and so forth. The other problem I had, then they wanted to take me home uh, for, their, um, uh, for their wife's cooking. Uh, and I would, rather than make a big deal out of the vegetarian thing, I would just say, um, hey, look, at, um, I have to get a physical every year. And, and then I'd blame it on John. I'd say, and my doctor said that I shouldn't be eating any uh, red meat. Uh, and so don't worry about that. I'll just eat the vegetables and so forth. And uh, most of them went along with that because uh, they didn't want to see me drop dead at the uh, dinner table <laughs> and get blamed for it. And so, you know, and the big, the big thing that he helped me with um, is the vacations because Ann and I took a lot of overseas vacations and frankly, we would spend half our time looking for something to eat uh, and we, you know, and so forth. And so on the McDougal program, we never really had a problem because uh, we had really great food everywhere we went. Um, and even, <laughs> and even had a five by eight card that she got a um, Costa Rican to write down her requirements. First item says no leche. <laughs> And uh, so we just give them the card. Sometimes they'd laugh, you know, and so forth. So, you know, um, I, I have to say that if you want to know the truth, uh, we would probably be dead by now if we hadn't met John because, um, you know, I grew up in the South and you know what the Southern diet is. It's uh, everything is deep fried. Um, and, um, and then on my travels, I ate stuff that I didn't even know what it was, you know, so that all got corrected and, you know, has greatly contributed to our lifespan. Yeah, We're, we have um, more and more friends that have died, ones that are younger than us um, due to their bad diet. So uh, it's scary when you know, you're getting to that age where your friends are dying, especially your younger ones. And you think, you know, they didn't have, that didn't have to happen. That didn't have to happen, but they resisted the message and you can only say so much and do so much. So, um, you know, but that's the thing as you get older, hearing all that, those stories. And now with the COVID thing happening as well, it just uh, emphasizes it. I wanted to tell you also, I, I, of course, got all John's books, and this was the first one. He and Mary put it together, making the change. Um, enjoyed getting, that's how we got started, because there were no books back in the 70s um, that we knew of that um, guided us in eating a healthy diet. So poor Mary, I can't imagine putting all those recipes together and all the ones she's done over the years for all the books they put out, it's uh, just amazing great recipes, they've taken us through a lot. So I wanted to tell you about one of the uh, adventure trips. <laughs> well, we had adventures on all the adventure trips, but one of them we were in, uh, we were, I think we were in Guatemala, John, and uh, they had very loose arrangements at the airport. We had to go to some other place in a small plane. And they had this thing you went through to check to see if you had any stuff on you. Really. Metal detector. You're right. And it, it wasn't even hooked up. Uh, then they came out and they said they had so many people on the plane. They didn't have room for everyone. Could somebody come sit with the pilot? John is pilot. And he got to sit with the pilot. <laughs> they took us to our next 
point of uh, adventure on that. Anyway, it was funny. I couldn't, everything was so loose with that monitor not working unplugged. And then they asked, <laughs> somebody could go, anybody could sit with the pilot. Well, I'm sure they were relieved that John was a pilot already, but that was, that was fun. Lots of, lots of adventures. And of course you get to a foreign country and, you know, they had everything so well planned. I mean, I can't believe it. We were in remote Remember that remote island in what lake was that? Anyway. Lake Titicaca. And there was an island that we went to. And we get up to this little village, didn't even see any people. It was so tiny. And they had our vegan meal. A poor little um, Heather had gone ahead and made sure that all these places they'd been told what food we wanted, what we didn't want. And here we were in this remote island in the middle of this lake getting our McDougal food. I mean... It was fabulous. I just I don't know how they did it back then, especially. Yeah. I don't know if we could do it again, John. Mm -hmm. But they're wonderful memories that we had from those things, unexpected anyway. Well, yeah. part of the population at Lake Titicaca lived on reed mats, like a little island out in the thing. And we were out there, and John and I were going around, and he went up to this guy and he says, Why are all the women here so fat? And when he said that, I took about three steps back and made like I didn't know John. <laughs> and it, tur it turns out that uh, the women don't get any exercise and all they eat is fish. So uh, we got that mystery solved. But my favorite uh, vacation story with John and Mary wasn't a, a McDougal trip. It was just a separate trip. Um, we went to Australia to the Great Barrier Reef and spent a week on a dive boat. And the other couple we went with, um, oh. <laughs> the, the husband was obese. He was so fat that he had to have a special wetsuit made. And we got to this one site and they said, OK, there's sharks down here. And they asked me as I was getting ready to go, he said, are you afraid of the sharks? Are you going to go on down? And I said, oh, yeah. And they said, why is that? And I said, well, Ron is going down and the sharks eat the fat ones first. <laughs> and I will have time to escape and get back to the boat. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so we went down and John had a uh, underwater camera. And he wanted me to go over where these sharks were and turn my back on them and, and so he could take my picture with them. And so, needless to say, no such picture was ever made. But I was beginning to wonder about my friendship with John, you know, for <laughs> sending me in front of a bunch of sharks. You know. But anyway, we did a lot of scuba diving and, and had a lot of adventures. So do you guys have any health problems at all? And do you mind telling your age? Mm, I'm, I, I'm 87. <laughs> the years go by so fast, especially with the COVID thing happening. 87. I'll be 88 this coming year in October. And Larry will be, of course, 100 in de next December. Right. Uh, uh, Wait, I Larry will be 100? I mean, 90. Excuse me. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm sorry. <laughs> See? <laughs> she never was very good at math, you know that. <laughs> I, I do have low thyroid, but not real low. It's like you know, so I'm on a, a low dose of whatever you take for the thyroid, and um, and I take a B12, and that's it. Now there's one other thing I take. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so. Not too much, a little ache in my back, um, um, in the low back, but I go to a massage person and I do exercises for that area and for my whole body. So we walk every day, which I think is important at our age to keep moving. And, uh, and then I do a cardio and um, yoga class also. So I try to keep the body moving and, um, you know, when that back is bothering me, I just lie down for a little bit, let those muscles relax. So I'd say really um, the main thing is the thyroid and uh, there's a mechanical heart thing, but it's not a big issue. So, yeah. 
And Larry? Well, well, I take B12, and then every once in a while I get GERD, so I take Tums. So that's about the extent of my problems. Yeah. And well, people, people ask are saying me that, that you look amazing, Jacqueline. People ask me if I have problems, and I say, well, I said, I still have all my original parts, but they're way out of warranty and could fail at any time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I've got high school and college classmates that have a laundry list of problems. And I went to one high school reunion and I was sitting around talking to my classmates that I played football with. And they were complaining that they couldn't get up the steps because the knees were bad and, you know, everything. And they, um, I said, well, look, at, here's what let's do. Let's all put $100 in the pot and the last person standing gets it all. And there was silence. And then one of my classmates said, Larry, we may talk slow, but we're not stupid. We're not putting $100 in the pot with a California vegan exercise nut. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have a bet. They wouldn't bet. Yeah. Dr. McDougall, do you have any questions for Larry and Ann? Oh, no, I, I, you know, I've known Larry and Anthony almost <laughs> years, and we, we're good friends. Uh, the one thing you need to know is they owned uh, <clears throat> the fanciest, most prestigious vegan restaurant in the world in San Francisco called the Millennium. Mm -hmm. And so they made a lot of contacts there, and they put a lot mm -hmm. of important messages out to the public. But I used to go to lectures, and Larry and Ann would be there. <clears throat> And I would ask, make Larry stand up and I'd say, this is what I want to look like when I'm his age. <laughs> <laughs> it just never One stops. time at a conference, he asked Ann and I to stand up and Ann stood up and he said, where's Larry? She said, I think he's in the room watching football. <laughs> and that got, that got a laugh and an embarrassing situation. <laughs> We had, we had an amazing time together. And you know, what, what might be fun, at least it would be fun for us, is just to get many of the people who traveled with us. And there are probably 3,000 people that have traveled with us over the period. Right. And get uh, some of the some of the re repeaters together and just talk about oh, the fun yeah. we had on all these adventure trips, like going down the Amazon. Yes. On a, a barge, an air-conditioned barge. I mean, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. We'll never, we'll never forget. We'd never be able to re redo. and. <laughs> I don't know whether it'd be of interest to anybody else, but uh, if well, we that would be, yeah, that would be fun. We had we had a wonder, we've had a, a yeah. wonderful time together. At, uh, yeah, at least. on that Amazon trip, they uh, asked if I wanted to go fishing, and I said sure. And so we got in a little boat, and there were about a half a dozen of us, and they took us this thing, and I said, "What are we fishing for?" And they said, "Piranha." And I said, what, "What's our bait?" And they said, "Raw meat." So they, they hooked up this thing and I got the first piranha and I was ringing it in and I tried to reach over and get the line and I missed it. And the piranha went over and fell in the lap of one of the women that were there. Barbara, Barbara, I can not think of her last name. I saw her a half a dozen times after that. And she always said, you're the one <laughs> put the piranha in my lap, you know. That's great. Well, you guys look amazing, and I've met you, and I know you really are amazing. So you know, thanks. You should, you should know they not just look good. I mean, Larry's out yeah. riding his bicycle, and you know, he, he had uh, snow skiing with his grandkids. You know, this this is a man that not only looks the part but lives the part, yeah. and uh, and too. I mean, she's she walks out there in the uh, in the morning with him, and you know, they just do really well. And you know how you know, the saying goes is if I know I'm not going to live so long, I'd have take, taken better care of myself. Well, these two did. They took good care of themselves and they've lived a long time. <laughs> That's all thanks to you, John. Well, all I appreciate thanks. I appreciate that. You know, I never get tired of hearing that I helped other people, particularly my good friends. And and, and, yeah. and Larry are some of our best friends. But thanks, thanks for having them on, AJ. That was real oh, nice. Yeah. It, it was it was at your suggestion. Thank you so much, uh, Larry and Ann. We hope to see you soon. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Take care. Well.
So now we have the man of the hour, Dr. John McDougall. And guys, he's going to be coming on not just once a month on Mondays, but he is going to come on twice a month because he has a lot of new lectures and he wants to test drive them on you guys. So aren't we honored to have him here talking about diabetes and what he would tell you if he were your doctor? Right. We're, I'm going to do a series. Uh, it's uh, McDougall's Medicine. It's something I always dreamed about doing. Uh, originally, I had it set up as an office uh, situation where I would hire a model, uh, have this person come in and act as the patient, and then talk about how I would take care of this particular person and have it filmed with the idea that other people might be interested in what I would say to say to a person in an office setting, because, you know, just realistically, I wouldn't be able to get to everybody. Well, that was the original thought, and uh, it's kind of smoldered in my brain for all this time. And finally, I figured out it could be done over the internet in a more powerful way. So we started out with the first lecture on uh, precocious puberty and uh, how your hormones get changed with a, a diet. And uh, that's available on YouTube, and it's on our channel as well as on uh, AJ's channel. And then the lecture I gave last time was on the on, on breast cancer all the things I'd want to have a patient who had breast cancer know and are told. And so I'm gonna do this whole series. This one's going to be on diabetes. These are the things that if I had a chance to sit down with you, I was the doctor, you were the patient. These are the things I wanna tell you that I, the things that I believe, you know, whether, whether, whether you end up believing them or not, it's not the important thing you, I think need to have, you need to be armed with the information that I have and then you can reference that information with what other doctors say and decide what you wanna do, decide what makes sense to you. And uh, so this lecture will be on diabetes today. Then we're gonna do one on autoimmune diseases, one on osteoporosis, uh, one on heart disease, probably one on cancer, other kinds of cancers. And um, it's just gonna be a whole series that we have set up. And uh, AJ, I, I wanna thank you very much for giving me the audience because it is so much, it's so much more realistic for me to know that I'm talking to people as opposed to just sitting in front of a screen and, and hopefully it'll bring me to life. <laughs> anyway, we'll try. So uh, yeah, I'd like to tell you about diabetes. I'd like to tell you about all the things that uh, I'd like to tell you. If we had a chance to sit down together, if I had a chance to be your doctor. And these things should be, uh, sh should be uh, the things that you have your doctor should be telling you these things. Uh, you know, this is a, a frank discussion a doctor should have with anyone facing a life with diabetes. You need to know these things. And I realize that uh, some of this gets a little bit complex, but if you'll bear with me, I'll explain it to you, I think in a manner that you'll easily understand it. It may take a, a, few, a few different repetitions of some of the same material. Plus, you're going to have the recording of this, so you can go back and listen to it. Plus, I put a lot more information on the slides than I'm able to communicate with you. And if you just go back and look at the slides, uh, you'll get a, a whole, whole different perspective, an important addition to what, what words I said to you. Plus, I say to the scientific literature, and although I may go through the studies quite quickly, because quite honestly, you don't need to know all the details, most of you but you need to know they exist. And for those of you who are more discerning, those of you who really wanna know what's going on, you could look up these studies. Most of them are available without charge on the internet. So there's a whole bunch of information coming your way. Be, please bear with me and we'll get through this all together. Uh, diabetes, diabetes. Well, the, the, main, the main criterion for diabetes is that the blood sugar rises above normal, then you're diabetic. But there are two kinds of diabetes. There's type one and type two. For both kinds of diabetes, the signs are, the most readily, readily available signs are, when you check your blood sugar, it's above 126 milligrams per deciliter. You know, when I started, uh, started in medicine, uh, it was uh, over 200 milligrams per deciliter that was the definition for diabetes. And then it went down to 160 milligrams per deciliter and then 140 milligrams per deciliter. Oh boy, I wondered why, why the, uh, the definition was changing. Well, I, I soon realized that um, the, the lower you make the number to call somebody diabetic, the more people you get into the business. 
So it's a way of opening up uh, your customers to a greater number than few people would meet the criterion of 200 milligrams per deciliter and more at 160 milligrams per deciliter, a lot more at 140 milligrams per deciliter. And now they're down to 126 milligrams per deciliter. And there are doctors out there that would treat you if your blood sugar was above 100 milligrams per deciliter. They would tell you that you have prediabetes and we need to nip it in the blood with these drugs. Hemoglobin A1C, which is a long-term measurement, as uh, uh, you become diabetic when it's above 6.5%. Now, symptoms of diabetes are shared between type 1 and type 2. Uh, you have an increased urinary output, and that's accompanied by an excess of thirst. Another thing that happens, and I know many of you who are type 2 diabetic in particular, you uh, look forward to this one, and that is that you lose weight easily. But you can lose an excess amount of weight to the point where friends and relatives are worried about you. So those are the symptoms of diabetes, but more important are the complications. And that is that uh, heavy diabetes, uh, you suffer from a metabolic handicap and the result is damage to all the tissues in your body, but particularly to the eyes, kidneys, nerves, and heart. You measure the blood sugar level either by uh, taking the glucometer and sticking it in your finger or on your finger and you get a value that is <clears throat> in terms of milligrams per deciliter. And if it's above 100 milligrams per deciliter, as I mentioned, it's considered abnormal. At 126, it'll be frankly diabetic. People over day one C, well, this is a long-term measurement. You know, you're taking the instantaneous reading with a blood sugar measurement. But if you wanna find out how the sugars have been controlled over a long period of time, say two or three months, what you do is you look at the hemoglobin A1C level. Now, less than 6% is considered normal, but levels can rise as high as 14%. Uh, I've known about this for a long time. I've talked about uh, glycosylated hemoglobin back in my book that I wrote in 1985. And I, this diagram is actually from that book. And here you see a protein molecule that does not have a bunch of sugars attached to it on the left. And then because of high, high, high amounts of sugar in the blood, these sugar molecules get attached to the protein. In this case, we're talking about hemoglobin. And once the sugar gets attached to the protein, the whole molecular environment changes and you distort the protein. And this may be one of the major mechanisms that leads to these serious complications in the eye and the kidney and throughout the body is these distorted proteins. So uh, you wanna keep the, the uh, hemoglobin A1C down to a normal level, which is, uh, let's just say 6%. That would be the amount of hemoglobin that is uh, glycosylated, which is, which is uh, represented by a percent. Now, this, this will take a little bit of time and I'm gonna go through this with you in several occasions as we progress through the slide presentation. What I wanna to talk to you about is how blood sugar gets from, from your table into your intestinal tract, into your bloodstream, and then into the cells. We're gonna talk about, first of all, a normal situation, no diabetes at all. In this situation, you have lots of insulin that works well, and you have lots of receptors on the cell that are very active. If we'll start at the top, what you see is the key. Insulin acts as a key to act activate glucose transport receptors. You've got to have the insulin for your transporters to work. The uh, bar that you see there in red is an inactive glucose transport receptor. And the one that looks like a Y is an active glucose transport receptor. And the blood sugar is represented by the orange triangle. So let's take a look at the first situation where you have uh, somebody without diabetes, somebody who's uh, functioning normally, somebody who's healthy. What you see is the insulin is acting as a key to open up the, uh, the receptors and allow them to work. And the receptors are, uh, are, uh, are taking in the glucose and allowing the glucose to pass through the cell wall and get it into the cell. That's a normal situation. We'll talk about the other ones as we go along. Let's talk about uh, type one diabetics. Type one diabetics are just a smaller percentage of di diabetics. Uh, certainly less than 10% of diabetics are type one, probably 
far less than 5% are type one, which means that 90, 95% of diabetics are the other kind, which is type two. In uh, type one diabetes, let's go back to this same graph here, the same image. And what you see in type one diabetes is you see plenty of sugar, the person's eating, the, the sugar goes into the bloodstream. There's lot, lots of sugar around and the cells are ready to accept these sugars and allow the sugars to pass into the cell where the sugars provide energy. But in this case, you don't have the keys to open up the cell wall. You don't have the, the insulin. And so as a result, the cells are starving because no sugar can get inside. This is a, a deadly condition that people develop type one diabetes. And of course you have to supply supplemental insulin in this case, otherwise the person becomes very sick and dies. Type one diabetes is due to destruction of the beta cells on the pancreas. The beta cells are insulin producing cells. And this occurs through an autoimmune reaction where the body attacks itself. How stupid the body to attack itself. Yeah, but it does. And the reason it attacks itself, itself is this, is animal proteins, they pass through the gut into the bloodstream. They're not supposed to do that intact, but sometimes they do intact. So you've got uh, whole animal proteins. In this case, what we're talking about is the beta casein on the milk protein. This uh, milk protein gets into the bloodstream and the body says, hey, this is a foreign substance. This could be a virus or a bacteria. I must make an antibody against it to destroy this foreign invading substance, which in this case is cow's milk. Well, the antibodies that are produced against cow's milk find similar structures on the beta cells of the pancreas. Yeah, and they get confused. They go and try and attack the cow milk protein, which is floating around the bloodstream, but they end up attaching to the surface, to the surface of the cells that produce insulin. And in that manner, they destroy the pancreatic cells. That's how you develop type one diabetes is through this autoimmune reaction. It's called molecular mimicry if you wanna look it up. And eventually it takes uh, somewhere between three and seven years. Eventually the pancreas is so destroyed that you're making insufficient amounts of insulin and, and probably no insulin at all. And so you have to supplement. In other words, you have to take insulin through a shot. These, uh, these similar parts the parts of protein that are similar between the cow's milk and the surface of the insulin producing cells of the pancreas are 17 amino acids. They, they are the same amino acids on the cow milk protein, the same amino acids on the, on the surface of the, of the beta cells of the pancreas. And so, well, the body, the, the antibodies, which are produced by the lymphocytes, are looking for the cow milk protein, they find, in addition, they find the same structure of 17 amino acids on the surface of the insulin producing cells and they attach to them and they destroy them. If you want to read the original paper on this, it was published in 1992. They identified the 17 amino acids that are shared between cow's milk and you. And in the process of the body doing something normal, which is to defend itself from an invading foreign substance, it destroys your tissues. So how do you treat uh, type one diabetes? Well, I take care of a lot of people with type one diabetes. In fact, I have to say it's one of the more fun doctor patient relationships that I get involved in, most rewarding. Because here you take a look at people who have a, a difficult life ahead of them. They have all kinds of complications that they face. Within 11 to 17 years, most diabetics have developed serious disease uh, to the eyes, to the kidneys, to the feet, or they've died. So uh, if you could take and you can fix these people by putting them on the right amount of insulin and feeding them a good diet, the rewards are tremendous, not just for the patient, but for the physician who needs to help people. So when I have somebody who comes in with type one diabetes, they're on insulin, they're gonna stay on insulin, but we're changing their diet. And as a result, what happens is their insulin works more efficiently. So I have to cut their insulin dose. And usually I cut it by a third or to a half. 
And it's better to err on the side of too little. You can always add more insulin, but too much insulin can result in serious adverse effects, particularly hypoglycemia. And if you become too low on your blood sugar, in other words, hypoglycemic, what happens is you get confused. You can actually lose consciousness. Uh, and as a result of this confusion, what happens is you could get involved in an auto accident. You could be accused of, uh, of a DUI. And you also subject yourself to injuries. Now, when I take care of somebody with type 1 diabetes, uh, I do it in, in various regimes as far as, as far as their insulin dosages go. First of all, these people are never on pills or shouldn't be. They're on insulin only. And what I try and do is I try to minimize the, uh, the time that a patient spends treating themselves during the day. And in some of these regimes, you have multiple injections that occur throughout the day, four, six, or more times you're injecting insulin. You're checking your blood sugars, you're making adjustments and so on. You know, that's an awful lot of time spent worried about your blood sugar levels and what kind of dose of insulin you're going to give. So what I try and do is make it as easy as I can for the patient. And I give them long acting insulin and my favorite one is Lantus, but there are other ones. And I strive to pick the right dose. So they only have to take one shot a day. This may not be possible. They may have to take two shots of Lantus a day. And in some cases, they may have to add shorter acting insulin, but that's not my goal. You know, I want to avoid hypoglycemia, but I want to give them enough insulin so that they're in good health and they can get plenty of sugar to pass into their cells so their cells are not starving to death. Now, of course, we only make this change in insulin dose after people get on the diet. And that's when I drop the insulin dosage by a third to a half. All right, let's talk about type two diabetes. This is the kind of diabetes that you can cure. In fact, you should expect to cure it. Uh, type two diabetes, here we go back to the same image and you see in type two diabetes, what you have is you've got plenty of sugar in the bloodstream. Of course, people with type two diabetes, they have elevated blood sugar levels and you have uh, insulin that's present. In fact, sometimes the insulin is present to a level that is, is twice as much as a normal person. There's loads of insulin around. The problem is, is that the transport receptors are inactive. The body has developed insulin resistance and we'll talk about why in just a minute. And so as a result, even though there's plenty of sugar, there's plenty of insulin around, loads of insulin that the body produces. What happens is the sugar can't get into the cells because the cells have developed insulin resistance. And that's type two diabetes. Do recall that I said that a type two diabetic has as much insulin and sometimes twice as much insulin as somebody without diabetes. Your lifetime risk of developing type two diabetes is about 40% for men and women. If you are a person of color, Hispanic or black, then your risk of developing diabetes is higher could be as high as 50%, but it's not because of anything that is metabolic or genetic. It has to do with your, 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 your living situation. And I have to say right off the right off is that uh, uh, people of color, your Hispanics, your blacks, uh, they have less opportunity, less education, less, you know, less opportunities to eat a healthy diet. And as a result, they end up more overweight with more of various kinds of diseases, including strokes, pancreatic or prostate cancer, um, all kinds of problems, but it's unique to these particular populations of people, not because of their color. No, it has to do with the social economic environments that they're involved in that causes them to have this inordinate excessive rate of type two diabetes. If you look at uh, people who follow various diets, you see their risk of getting type two diabetes varies drastically. You know, your typical American diet, your non-vegetarian diet, you have a very high risk of developing type two diabetes. If you improve on this diet a little bit and you're semi-vegetarian, you have a reduced risk of diabetes. If you have a vegetarian diet with fish, even better, and a lacto-vegetarian diet. Remember, we're not talking about type one diabetes, we're talking about type two now. So the dairy issue is not important. You have a reduced risk of getting type two diabetes. And of course, a vegan, which is the kind of diet that we promote. 
and there are a lot of high fat vegan diets that this doesn't apply to. If we had a bar for somebody who ate a low fat vegan diet, like the type of diet that I recommend, you'd find that the risk of type two diabetes is essentially zero. Around the world, uh, as people become wealthier, you have uh, populations living in these particular countries, developing obesity, heart disease, breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, and more and more and more diabetes. And uh, the studies, uh, what we find is that <clears throat> the incidence of a type two diabetes in China in 2018 was 12.4%. The incidence of prediabetes in China in 2018 was 50%. Half the population is prediabetic. However, before 1980 in China, fewer than 1% of the Chinese population had type 2 diabetes. Before 1980, 90% of the China's Chinese diet was white rice. And they didn't have diabetes. But in 1980, things changed for China and a lot of other nations around the world. They become wealthier. They took advantage of uh, the harnessing of fossil fuels and the industrial revolution and all the technology out there. They listened to cable news and learned about how uh, people of wealth, such as Americans, lived and they wanted to emulate that particular kind of lifestyle and they have. China's one of the richest nations on this planet. And that wealth has been translated into a diet that makes them overweight and sick, including diabetes. Now, I wanna to explain to you that type two diabetes is really not a disease. It's a normal adaptation, which give you, gives you advantages to survive. When uh, late fall and winter approach, uh, there's less food and uh, a good thing to happen to get ready for this time of less food would be to store extra fuel. And the body does that. It stores it as body fat so you can make it through times of near famine. That's normal. That's a survival advantage. And uh, that allows you to maybe gain 30 to 50 pounds, but not more than that. You know, that's enough to get you through the winter. Not more than that, so it becomes a disadvantage. And the way the body accomplishes this is it develops insulin resistance. In other words, the, the, uh, the, body, the body does not transfer the blood sugar from the blood into the cells readily because there's a decrease in glucose uh, transporters. This is normal, this is natural. But what's not normal and what is not to the advantage uh, as far as your survival is concerned is to become morbidly obese. That's uh, put you in a situation where you are easy prey from the saber, saber tooth tiger. You know, if you were gain, to gain an extra 100 pounds and sometimes as much as 800 pounds because you didn't develop insulin resistance, which is the normal situation. And I see people who do this. I see patients who, are, who weigh 500 pounds. I, I've seen news uh, stories where they had to take a forklift into the bedroom of a patient that weighed over 1,000 pounds. What happened is these people did not develop insulin resistance, which would protect them from morbid obesity. You know, for becoming a size where you, you couldn't climb up a tree and get away from the saber tooth tiger, to a size where you couldn't get into the small opening of the cave. So it's normal and natural. It's an adaptation to develop insulin resistance, which we call type two diabetes. It's not in the classic sense of disease or something going wrong with the body. Nothing wrong with the body, it's doing what it's supposed to do. So how do we treat type two diabetics? Well, they've got plenty of insulin, they've got plenty of blood sugar. So what I do is when I see somebody with type two diabetes is I stop the medication. I stop all of their insulin or at least most of it. And I have some people who see me who weigh as much as, or are taking as much as 120 units of insulin a day. I know you think this sounds brave for me to do this, but I know first of all, that the oral medications are uh, medications that are used for non-insulin dependent diabetes, which is type two diabetes. 
Type 2 diabetes is described as non-insulin dependent. It means that you don't have to take insulin. You don't have to take pills. The pills are dangerous as we're gonna talk about. And so uh, it's important to get people off the medication so that, uh, well, so that they uh, feel normal, act normal and can get healthier. But just treat it with a healthy diet. And of course that healthy diet is a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. All right, now I wanna to talk to you about, uh, about uh, something that's within the spectrum of diabetes. You know, you have the type one where you're not making any insulin. You have the type two where, uh, uh, type two diabetics where you have loads of insulin. And then you have something in between. Uh, you have partial insulin insufficiency. You make enough insulin to keep yourself out of the hospital, keep from dying with ketoacidosis, but you don't make enough insulin to keep the blood sugar normal. And let's take a look at this. You see the situation with, with type one and a half diabetes or partial pancreatic insufficiency. You see that uh, situation where you've got uh, some inactive receptors and some active receptors. You've got plenty of insulin, you've got plenty of sugar in the bloodstream, but not enough sugar gets into the cells. Too much sugar stays in the bloodstream, which is measured as an abnormally high blood sugar level. That's type one and a half diabetes. And that's what confuses a lot of people. Uh, people will uh, come into my practice and they'll go on a healthy diet and they'll lose a lot of weight, which as you'll learn in a minute, uh, cures most of, of people with type two diabetes. Uh, they'll lose a whole bunch of weight and still their blood sugar is elevated. Well, it's because your pancreas is, uh, is not functioning as well as it should and uh, your cells have developed partial resistance. And uh, as a result, you have type one and a half diabetes. And the way we treat this, well, the way we treat, I treat type one and a half diabetes is kind of a hybrid between just food and uh, taking insulin is uh, what I do is I give them enough, enough medication so they won't end up in the hospital. And that medication is always insulin. It's never oral medications, never pills of any kind, never shots that are not insulin shots. It's only insulin to take care of these people with type one and a half diabetes. And you have to pick a dose and picking the dose is just a guess, ladies and gentlemen. You know, I, I see somebody, I take a look at them, I listen to their history of uh, what their blood sugars have run, you know, how overweight they are. And I take a guess, you know, how much of pancreatic insufficiency do you suffer from? In other words, how much supplemental insulin will I have to give you? Well, most of these people, I drastically reduce the insulin that they're taking or probably most of the time I stop the insulin that they're taking and I will add it back if necessary. And again, it's better to err on the side of too little medication rather than too much. You know, too much medication could result in severe hypoglycemia, brain damage, eye damage. You know, it's, it's a big deal to over-treat. So say I take a guess uh, as far as how much uh, insulin I need to give somebody with type one and a half diabetes, enough medication so that they don't end up in the hospital, enough medications so that their blood sugars are maybe a little bit better, but not normal. Well, this person, after a while, what happens is they may develop uh, too much weight loss. Remember, insulin not only drives sugar into regular cells, but it drives fat into fat cells. And if you don't have enough insulin or it's not working efficiently, what happens is you end up losing weight because fat is not being allowed into your fat cells. Now with the elevated blood sugar, what happens is you develop frequent urination, which can be troublesome. And that's accompanied by excess of thirst. But another issue that causes me to treat people with type one and a half diabetes is everybody's worried about them. You're worried about your blood sugar numbers because they're elevated. Your mother-in-law is worried about your blood sugar levels. Your doctor's worried about your blood sugar levels. And so is your dietician. Well, one way to get rid of the worry is to put you on a little bit of insulin and everybody thinks that all is going well. You're being treated by a doctor who really knows and cares. So I'll add a little bit of insulin to those circumstances too. But believe me, 
if you have partial pancreatic insufficiency, in other words, type one and a half diabetes, you're at risk of becoming way too thin. And you may need an extra amount of insulin to uh, allow the fat to get into your fat cells. But remember, not so much insulin that you develop hypoglycemia and get into big trouble there. That low blood sugar, that hypoglycemia causes brain damage, eye damage, and other damages to the body. All right, I wanna share with you some facts that you may not realize are true. And that is weight loss from any approach cures type two diabetes. Now the common approach is uh, for losing weight that are not the McDougall approach. Uh, you can diet, in other words, you can restrict the amount of food that you eat and then you suffer the pain of hunger. Or you can lose weight with bariatric surgery. In other words, uh, the doctor can come in and re rearrange your intestinal tract so that you lose weight. Well, surgery is painful, surgery costs money and there are lots of risks from surgery. And then you can lose weight from a low carb diet. That's the opposite of the McDougall diet. But you must realize that the way you lose weight on a low carbohydrate diet is you become sick. But the first approach that I wanna to talk to you about is uh, calorie restriction dieting. And uh, what happens is uh, the doctor may say to you, if you just lose weight, Mabel, if you just lose weight, your diabetes will go away. And you believe it. And it's true. Just weight loss will cause your diabetes to improve or go away. So here's the, the situation. You go to see a doctor and the doctor says, Mabel, you're going to get rid of your diabetes by losing weight. I want you to follow this diet I got from, from, uh, from Galacto Smith Drug Company. One of the representatives came in and gave me a one page sheet that teaches you how to diet. So I want you to follow this diet. I want you to lose some weight, but because your blood sugar is up, I must put you on medications and these medications cause weight gain. Insulin does. So do many of your other medications that raise the insulin levels, remember, Insulin forces fat into fat cells. So here you leave the doctor's office with instructions. You're supposed to lose weight. You were given a diet. You're supposed to take the medications. Well, the medications cause you to gain weight. So you go back and see the doctor the next month and the doctor says, hey, Mabel, get up on the scale. And the doctor walks over to the scale and says, hey, you have gained weight. I told you to lose weight. And now, you're, now your blood sugars are higher. Now I've got to give you more medication and you get into this vicious downhill struggle. The pills are causing you to gain weight. You hardly stand a chance of losing weight by certainly calorie restriction. To stop this vicious cycle, what I do is I stop the medication. I, st I stop the main cause for people gaining weight. As a result, they start losing the weight and yes, they can cure their type two diabetes, not type one, but type two diabetes, just by losing weight. And that can be accomplished by dieting. Uh, bariatric surgery. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of research done. Of course, it's a very profitable business. So what would you expect? And what is found by causing surg surgically induced malabsorption and sickness? They rearrange your stomach, they put bands, they put sleeves, all kinds of things to make your intestinal tract abnormal so that your eating behavior will not result in obesity. In fact, you'll lose weight. And the, uh, these studies have found that 78% uh, of people cure their diabetes just with the weight loss caused by bariatric surgery. So it, it's almost 100% curable by just losing weight. Uh, low carb diets like the Atkins diet cause people to lose weight. They initially lose water weight. They lose six to eight pounds. So uh, when they stop eating uh, any types of sugar, they burn their glycogen off, which is stored in their livers and muscles. And they'll go and get, lose about six to eight pounds of water. And then what happens if you stay on the Atkins diet for a little longer, you go into ketosis. That's one of the main principles of the Atkins low carb diet is you need to go into ketosis which is described by many people as a state of bliss. It's not a state of bliss, it's a state of sickness. And so you uh, end up 
losing weight and as a result, your diabetes can get better. But I want to point out to you, these diets are very dangerous. I could provide for you five large reviews that have looked at the low carb diets and show that these diets increase your risk of dying and suffering from heart disease. So, you know, don't be fooled. Weight loss is just one of the things that's accomplished. I uh, wrote an article that was uh, published in Mayo Clinic Proceedings, and you could read that whole article if you want. It's on the right-hand side of the slide. But uh, it was in response to somebody who was bragging about the benefits of a low carb Atkins type diet. They said, not only do you lose weight, but you lower cholesterol and blood sugar and triglycerides. And, you know, and in that way you, you can cause the patient to be healthier. And it's not just weight loss, they'll be benefited by, by having a reduction in risk factors, which can be translated into better health. Risk factors like cholesterol and triglycerides and blood sugar. Well, I pointed out in this uh, particular letter I wrote, I said, you can, also, you can also lose weight by taking cancer chemotherapy. Cancer chemotherapy. What happens is you lose weight, you get sick. Like with these low carb diets, you get sick. And as a result of sickness, you don't eat. And your blood sugar comes down, your cholesterol comes down, your triglycerides come down. Yes, they do. Yeah. Similar benefits for similar reasons are seen when patients undergo cancer chemotherapy, like with the low carb diets and physicians do not brag about these results. Can you imagine if you went to a doctor and the doctor said it's weight loss and I can make you sick enough to cause you to lose weight? Well, you got the similarity there. So uh, how do I uh, take care of people who have type two diabetes? Uh, the thing that you need to know is you have to be very careful about the treatments that you use because not only do diabetic drugs lower blood sugar, but they also kill type two diabetic patients. I tried to get some legislation passed in the state of California where uh, the state of California would require that doctors put out an informed consent when they saw diabetic patients and they treated them with these medications and informed consent will require that the patient be told that taking these medications will increase their risk of dying. Yeah. Well, let's talk about medications that are used. Uh, the first line therapy for uh, treating uh, type two diabetics with, with medication we're talking about now is metformin. And oh boy, doctors think this is such a great drug, drug because it doesn't cause weight gain and it may actually help the arteries. That's what they say. And more than half of the 58 million Medicare patients are on metformin for their non-insulin dependent, non-insulin dependent, remember you don't have to take insulin, type two diabetes. Well, it's highly questionable whether this medication is of any benefit at all. Uh, for example, a meta-analysis of uh, the clinical trials that have done uh, using glucose or those using glucophage metformin to treat uh, type two diabetics, uh, they, they couldn't rule out a 30%, 31% increase in all cause mortality, nor could they rule out a 64% increase in cardiovascular mortality. In other words, you know, the claim that it reduces your risk of dying of heart disease is just plain and simple, not supportable. And uh, this review in the British Medical Journal, uh, what they've what they concluded was the results of the study do not justify aggressive treatment of type two diabetes using metformin. Uh, another, another study, a meta-analysis of randomized trials of people with type two diabetes using metformin and specifically looking at whether they reduce the risk of dying of strokes and heart attacks or having heart surgery. Well, the conclusion is, the conclusion is there remains uncertainty about whether metformin reduces the risk of cardiovascular mortality. And, and I have to tell you the idea that somehow metformin can help the arteries, the big arteries, like the ones that go to the heart and brain and the small arteries that uh, go to the retina and the kidneys and your peripheral nerves is based upon the finding that 
only this finding that eye damage is reduced based upon photographs of the eye, which are subjectively evaluated. That's it. It's not a reduction in dying of heart disease or strokes or having heart surgery. It's, it's just based on these photographs of the retinas. A uh, second line therapy is sulfonylureas. There's a whole list of sulfonylureas down there. About 30% of, of sales of diabetic medications are represented by sulfonylureas, which were also used as herbicides. Back in uh, 1972, 1972, the physician's desk reference started with started coming out with warnings on all oral diabetic medications. Uh, these specific warnings started out with a statement at the beginning of the paragraph. This was in heavy black print at the beginning of the description of the drug in the physician's desk reference, which is a book that almost every doctor used to have on their table that they used all day long to determine the benefits and risks and hazards and costs and so on, not costs, but benefits and risks and scientific studies and so on, to decide whether or not they were gonna use a particular medication to treat their patients in heavy black print. Based upon the UGTP study is they found a rate of cardiovascular, that means strokes and heart attacks, mortality to be approximately two and a half times that of patients who were treated with diet alone. And that warning has continued up to this date. These drugs are dangerous. There are six major studies and only six have been done. And I'm gonna show you these studies. You can go look them up later on. I'm gonna give you the basic conclusions. These studies uh, show that aggressive treatment for diabetes kills. Aggressive treatment, what that means is using lots of pills, using lots of insulin when necessary. I mean, sometimes they'd give the patient four, four, four shots of insulin a day and they would check their blood sugar four and more times a day. They'd have them on three or four different kinds of medication. That's aggressive treatment. And the goal of aggressive treatment is to get the hemoglobin A1C down to about 6%. You know, that's what they tried to do. So they did some randomized control trials and uh, one group uh, got standard care. In other words, they didn't pay a lot of attention to their hemoglobin A1Cs and they let them run approximately eight to 9%. And the other group, the intervention group, they really treated them aggressively. And here are the results of the studies of the six studies done. Oh, by the way, before I tell you this, you must understand that whether or not a drug was approved by the FDA to be used to treat diabetics dependent upon whether or not it lowered blood sugar didn't have anything to do with whether or not the patient ended up healthier. I mean, you couldn't outright kill the patients with the drugs, but the main criterion as to whether or not you are able to advertise yourself as a diabetic medication is whether or not it lowered blood sugar. So here are the six different studies that have been done. Well, you have the diabetes control and complication trial, uh, which was done, published in 1998. And the conclusion is it may increase the risk of coronary artery disease in this subset of subjects with time. And then you had the Veterans Affairs Cooperative Study. They found a strong tendency toward worsening cardiovascular outcomes in patients with intensive control. You know, when you aggressively treated the patient, more heart disease. And then they had the TRACE study, the largest European study ever done. And they showed an increase in mortality following acute myocardial infarction when you aggressively treated the patients. And then in 2008, the New England Journal of Medicine came out with three major studies that really put the nails in the coffins of the diabetic industry if scientists, doctors, politicians would have listened to the results of the study. These six studies, you have the ACCORD study, which was uh, published in 2008. The, the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute stopped this study 17 months early because of an increased risk of dying in the aggressively treated group. 17 months early, it was stopped. You have the advanced study. The advanced study showed no significant effects when it came to 
reducing the risk of, uh, of uh, major vascular events like strokes and heart attacks, no, no benefit. And hypoglycemia was much more common in the aggressively treated group. And then finally, and this is the last of the studies done. Finally, we have the Veterans Affairs study. And uh, what they found was that those who were treated aggressively gained an average of 18 pounds compared to nine pounds with a standard group and sudden death was three times higher. Ladies and gentlemen, there are no other studies of this level to help you to decide whether or not you're gonna take these medications. Diabetic drugs kill. <laughs> so uh, a, a, a uh, effort to reduce the hemoglobin A1C down to 6% resulted in a dramatic increase of poor outcomes, including death. Well, the control groups uh, were eight to nine percent, the hemoglobin A1C, and with the intervention groups, they got close to six percent in these various trials. What did doctors do about this? Well, they knew you couldn't lower the uh, hemoglobin A1, uh, uh, the hemoglobin A1C down to what is a normal level of six percent. That was just dangerous. And sometimes these hemoglobin A1C levels got up to fourteen percent. So, what are they going to do? to come to recommendations for your doctors to treat you well, just based upon a hunch, just, just a guess, no data. I mean, there's no data that shows that somebody with a hemoglobin A1C level of seven or 8% does better than somebody with a hemoglobin A1C level of 10 to 12%. We know they do worse when it's down to 6%. They proposed as a compromise based on a guess, not data, that the goal your doctor should have for you to get your hemoglobin A1C is down to 7 to 8%. Huckaday made a very important statement uh, back in 1987. He said, it is important to remember that diabetic control means a lot more than blood sugar control. I mean, not only do we have to control the blood sugar, but we've got to keep the patient alive and healthy. We've got to be concerned about them dying. We've got to be concerned about them suffering from illnesses, heart disease, eye disease and kidney disease. Well, industry responded and we, they developed newer drugs that you see advertised on your cable news network, intensively advertised because they're so darn it profitable. And uh, they developed drugs that actually reduce the risk factors associated with cardiovascular disease, strokes and heart attacks. But <laughs> these particular drugs have other problems and I'll show you the three classes of drugs that are done in the studies that evaluated their benefits as well as their troubles. The, in, in 2008, the Food and Drug Administration, they said, you know, you ought to start paying attention to other things besides just lowering blood sugar. And uh, they, they gave some guidance, nothing enforceable, nothing legal, they just told the drug companies that you probably should pay better attention. And they responded with these, uh, with these particular drugs. These are the drugs that have been uh, advertised as reducing your risk of dying of heart disease and strokes, cardiovascular mortality. Yes, because as I showed you, the six major studies showed the other drugs dramatically increased your risk of dying of heart disease. So industry, bless their hearts, they decided that they were going to answer this call to make drugs that reduce risk factors associated with having strokes and heart attacks. So the, uh, one of the studies that was done uh, on uh, this particular medication showed, uh, this is uh, Jardius, Jardius medication, they showed that uh, you reduce the risk of cardiovascular complications by 2.2%. That's all, 2.2%. Whereas uh, they also increase the risk of genital infections and leg and foot amputations. Uh, Victoza, that's the one that's advertised a lot to you. 1.3% reduction, 1.3% reduction in cardiovascular complications. But it increased your risk of gastrointestinal problems, particularly pancreatitis caused uh, low blood sugar reactions, kidney damage and thyroid cancers. And the last class of drugs 
uh, what they did is they, uh, they found that it reduced the risk of cardiovascular problems by a lousy 2.3%. But you ended up with more eye damage and with the possibility of uh, blindness. These are very profitable medications, ladies and gentlemen. That's why they are promoted so much to you. But they fall way short of what you think the drug company should be able to do or what you hope they'd be able to do for you. All right. I want to straighten out some other misinformation until I can so I can talk to you about the proper way to treat diabetes. Uh, first of all, you need to understand that diabetes is not caused by sugar. It's not, we knew that a long time ago. We knew that in 1927 when Shirley Sweeney treated his, uh, his medical students with various kinds of diets and then did glucose tolerance tests on them. And what you see along the, uh, uh, along the, x-axis, you see the times and you see the blood sugar levels along the y-axis. And what he did is he took the students, he fed them a diet that was very high in sugar. That diet consisted of table sugar, candy, pastries, white bread, baked potatoes, syrup, bananas, rice, and oatmeal. And all of his student tested non-diabetic. They were normal. And then he fed the same students a high fat diet, olive oil, butter, mayonnaise, egg yolks, 20% cream. And all of his otherwise healthy students became diabetic based on the glucose tolerance test. Hemsworth, Percival Hemsworth, he established this with be, beyond any doubt there was a high fat diet that caused diabetics to get worse, their blood sugars to get high and that I, high sugar diet, a high carbohydrate diet resulted in normal blood sugars. And he published this data in the British Medical Journal in 1940. Percival Hemsworth is the father of diabetes. Uh, Brunzel did studies at University of Washington that were published in 1971 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, what he did is he took type two diabetics and he started them out on a diet that was 45% simple sugar. And they weren't starches, they weren't complex carbohydrates, they were simple sugars, dextrans and maltose. And then what he did is he doubled the sugar intake to 85% of the calories from simple sugar. And what he found is every aspect of diabetes improved. Yeah. Fasting insulin was lower, glucose tolerance tests were lower, blood sugars fell, fasting blood sugars, every aspect of diabetes improved by doubling the amount of sugar fed to his test subjects and what they conclude. These data suggest that a high, carbo diet, high carbohydrate diet increased the sensitivity of peripheral tissues to insulin. In other words, sugar makes insulin work better. Walter Kempner, Duke University, developed the rice diet, which is a diet of fruit, fruit juice, simple sugars, and uh, white rice. And he got tremendous improvements in the health of his patients. But one of the things you need to note is he essentially cured 100% of type two diabetics with this diet. And here's the diet, here's the diet. Uh, standard American diet is about 38%. The diet of rice and sugar was 2% fat, 4% protein, and 94% sugar. And in patients who needed to gain weight, they would off, often feed them 2,000 calories of white sugar to add extra calories to the diet. And yet the uh, improvements in health in patients are not matched by any other diet or any other approach. Curing malignant hypertension, curing type two diabetes, curing or stopping the progression of kidney failure and heart failure. If you don't know Walter Kempner, you should learn about Walter Kempner. I, I talked about him in my December, 2013 newsletter. <clears throat> Type two diabetics, when they were fed a diet of omega-3 fats, fish oils, what happened to their diabetes is it got worse. Oil paralyzes insulin, makes the cells more resistant to insulin. Sugar makes insulin work better. Now, how in the world are you gonna get well if you don't know this, if you can't straighten out this 
this contrary information to what the truth is and what you've been told. You don't stand a chance. So when they fed uh, omega-3 fats, fish oil supplements, what happened is the blood sugar increased by 22% and the blood sugar after meals increased by 35%. Now that was type two. And when they treated type one diabetics with, with oil or high fat meals, it wasn't, it wasn't oil tablets or capsules, it was high fat meals. What they found is that type one diabetics, you know, those people who have to take insulin, what happened is their requirement for insulin increased. On the low fat diet, they required nine units. On the high fat diet, they required 13 units of insulin. They require more insulin because fat paralyzes insulin activity. Now, just wanna to touch on the potato for just a minute because the potato has been so maligned. Uh, there are people out there that say uh, type two diabetes is caused by eating potatoes. Well, the research really shows that that if you eat fried potatoes, what happens is you have an increased risk of developing type two diabetes. But the, the, final, the final study, that really the final verdict was in this study that was published, which looked at non-fried potatoes and found out that they do not raise blood sugar levels. They do not cause diabetes. In fact, just the opposite. So let's talk about uh, the low fat diet that I use uh, to treat type two diabetes. And, my most important mentor as far as learning this diet so that I could help you with your care, it was Nathan Pritikin. And again, if you don't know about Nathan Pritikin, you can find out about him in my February, 2013 newsletter, which is on my website. And the diet that I use is a pattern after this pioneer, as well as uh, several other pioneers in, uh, in the field of medicine that came before me. Let's take a look at the, uh, the, the history of using a high carbohydrate, you know, like I recommend, low fat diet and taking care of type two diabetics. This was by a man named Rabinovich, Rabinovich and he treated 500 patients. He had 16 failures. Patients were highly satisfied by using a high carbohydrate, low fat diet back in 1930, he published this. Uh, he also said that patients would rather eat a healthy diet than to take insulin and to be underweight. They'd rather eat a healthy diet and cure their disease. This is back in 1930. I talked about Walter Kempner and his, his uh, findings, which were published in the, in the late 30s and during the 1940s and 50s. You know, essentially cured all the type two diabetics with a diet of white rice, fruit, fruit juice, and simple sugars. Uh, Pritikin, in his re re reports, uh, Nathan Pritikin found that they were able to lower glucose levels from 183 to 150 milligrams per deciliter. They were able to decrease medication from their patients uh, taking a total of 284 pills down to 75 pills. And on average, they reduce the shots of insulin from uh, 280 to 158 injections. Or no, no, excuse me, the patients who required ejections went, uh, went down that level, of injections of insulin. And then we have from the University of Kentucky, we have James Anderson, who published his work in the late 70s. And he put people on a, on a um, high carbohydrate, low fat diet, kind of patterned his diet off of Nathan Pritikin's work. And what they reported, this is one of the most respected universities and one of the most respected researchers in the world at that time. Insulin usage, uh, uh, the average reduced their amount of insulin from 26 to 11 units daily. And their diet was not as strict as the diet I recommended, the diet Nathan Pritikin recommended. And uh, 11 of the 20 patients uh, discontinued their insulin. Uh, David Jenkins from University of Toronto, he did an experiment where he put people on a vegetarian, low fat, high carbohydrate diet and uh, improvements in blood sugars and diabetics with 39% stopping their insulin and 71% stopping their pills. Neil Bernard, who is alive, well and active for the Physicians Committee of Responsible Medicine uh, published a study recently in 2006 
where he compared the American Diabetic Association diet with a vegan diet. It happened to be essentially our diet, the McDougall diet. And uh, what they found is the hemoglobin A1Cs decreased down to uh, minus 1.2, as opposed to an increase in the American diet, diet the American Diabetic Association diet. The uh, vegan diet, as I mentioned, was a diet very similar to what I recommend, as opposed to the American Diabetic Association diet, which is a relatively high fat, low carbohydrate diet. Nathan Pritikin used to say that the American Diabetic Association diet guarantees that all diabetics will remain diabetic. Yeah, that's what he used to say. And of course we have our work, uh, which is published recently, and we found nearly 90% of the 1,703 people that we studied and reported on, were able to reduce or stop their diabetic medications. So how about, uh, that's, tr that's treating the diabetes. How about the complications of diabetes, which lots of people suffer from and would very much like to have improved uh, problems with the, uh, the blood vessels, the small blood vessels problems with the eyes, problems with the kidneys, problems with the nerves. Let's take a look at the research here. Let me start by uh, giving you a quote from uh, Elliot Joslin of the famous Joslin Clinic. Many of you have heard about Joslin. He prof prophetically wrote in 1927 the following. And I'd like to read this to you. I believe the chief cause of premature atherosclerosis and diabetes Safe for advancing age is an excess of fat, an excess of fat in the body, obesity, an excess of fat in the diet, and an excess of fat in the blood. With an excess of fat, diabetics, diabetes begins, and from an excess of fat, diabetics die, formerly of coma and recently of atherosclerosis. In 1927, he wrote this. And by the way, he continued by saying it shouldn't be long before with good scientific study, we have this all figured out. Excuse me, it's been, it's been what? Almost a hundred years. Uh, one of the complications of uh, diabetes of both kinds is to have the, the retina of the eye be damaged. And the damage you see by looking inside of the eye, the damage you see here on the left, you see the white materials, these are exudates. And then you see the rem red flame uh, spots there, these are hemorrhages. And you see in this particular patient, uh, just over a short period of time on a very low fat diet, they were able to re reverse their, their diabetic retinopathy, which could have caused this person to go blind. And of the uh, 44 patients that they studied, 20 of them showed this kind of improvement, dramatic improvement. And Walter Kepner wasn't the only one, a fellow by the name of Van Eck, he did uh, similar studies using a low-fat diet and confirmed that you reverse diabetic retinopathy. And how is that treated these days? Well, with lasers. I prefer diet. Uh, the kidneys. The kidneys are affected by the kind of diet that you feed a person. A low-protein diet reduces the progression of kidney disease and death on average by 33 to 50%. You know, this has been known for a, a hundred years. As far as pain in the feet, burning of the feet, numbness of the feet, which is called peripheral neuropathy, we have a couple of studies that should cause your interest. One was done at Weimar Institute by Milton Crane. What he found was complete relief of, of these peripheral neuropathies, the pain occurred in 17 of 21 patients put on a diet similar to what I recommend. And that occurred within four to 16 days and their benefits remained for four years. So the message here is you can cure peripheral neuropathies or at least benefit them. And there's no other treatment that's of any help out there. There's no drugs that solve this problem. And Neil Bernard, he published a study recently in 2015 on uh, the effect of a healthy diet, a diet essentially the same as what I recommend. And uh, he found that it helped with diabetic neuropathy. People got better. So to conclude, 
if you're a diabetic, type one or type two, but particularly type two, my question to you is, are you tired of being managed, switching from one drug to the next, waiting for the next complication to occur? Are, are you really tired of being treated the way that people are standardly treated in the medical system these days? Well, if you are, then you might look to the cure. The cure is a healthy diet and associated weight loss. It works, costs you nothing, there are no side effects. And you can learn this diet free from my website, drmcdougall.com, or you can take the 12 day telemedicine, telehealth course that we teach, where you get support from our physician, support from our support staff, which meets you every morning and sees how you're doing, sees what your blood sugar is, uh, works with you on the day's meal plan where you can take advantage of multiple lectures from experts, the world's best experts, Doug Lyle, Jeff Novick, Anthony Lim. And you know what? I even lecture at the program. In fact, Mary and I have a chance to spend every morning with you at a fireside chat. It's a great program, folks. And the way you sign up for it is to go to our website. Uh, the next class is full. We end up filling up almost every class long before the time is due to start the class. But there are future classes that you can sign up for. All right, well, thank you very much for listening. I hope I shared a few concepts with you on uh, taking care of uh, diabetes, how you can cure it, what causes it. And uh, I'd like to open the, 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 the audience for questions if we could. That was so good, Dr. McDougall. That was amazing. Well, I hope I, I hope it caused you to have no faith and a lot of suspicion at the current way diabetics are treated. Yeah, they're ma they're managed. That's it. Like you said, managed. And with type uh, with type two diabetics or type one diabetics, even though you can't cure their disease, they stop having complications. Uh, type one diabetics, uh, they're the, some of the most important people to treat with a healthy diet. Hello, Mary. Hello. <laughs> Hey, look who you got. Hi, Mary. Hi. They're, they're some of the more important people to treat because their, their future is so dismal. Uh, you know, they end up on dialysis machines. They end up going blind. You know, all kinds of serious problems with type 1 diabetics. You know, the only type 1 diabetics I've seen with all of their parts working after 50 years of disease, were those who were taken care of by Walter Kempner on the rice diet. And I certainly think that the same will happen to type one diabetics that follow the McDougall diet is yeah, you you'll have to take insulin, but you'll live a normal life with all your parts working and a normal length of life too. That's type one diabetes and type two diabetics. You can plan on a cure guaranteed <laughs> type two diabetes. The diabetes is a hundred percent curable with a healthy diet and associated weight loss. Uh, there's something in between. Remember, type one and a half diabetes, which is, you know, still is a disease that needs to be treated and managed with some medication. And uh, people, of course, need to eat a healthy diet, regardless of what kind of diabetes you call it, type one, type one and a half or type two. You mentioned dialysis, Dr. McDougall, and one of the live viewers said that they are on dialysis. And would the starch solution be helpful? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, I, I, would, I would get the book, uh, McDougall's Medicine, A Challenging Second Opinion. It's free. Just go to our website and you can pick up this book as well as the McDougall Program for Women. We're going to be offering a, at least six of the books that uh, Mary and I have written for free over time. And that book is available and it talks to you about kidney disease and what the benefits would be. First of all, it's been known for 100 years that people who are on dialysis, they avoid meat. It stinks. They're repulsed by meat and for very good reason. <laughs> it's that meat makes them sicker, worse. Uh, taking care of a person who's on dialysis is a difficult job because uh, you know not only are these people very ill, but they're also being managed by doctors and dietitians who have no understanding about a diet and its importance in kidney failure. And if they do have the slightest knowledge about it, they don't practice it. In fact, the typical scenario is when you go to see a nephrologist, a diabetic doctor or a diabetic dietitian, you'll be sent off to the dietitian's office to learn about a low protein diet. But you'll hear also that you're not gonna follow it. 
you know, it's, it's too hard to work. You know, you don't have to follow a good diet. Just come on over here in the back room here. I want to show you our dialysis ward. We're just going to stick, so we're just going to attach you to this dialysis machine. And no matter what you eat, no matter how bad it is, we're just going to suck that stuff off. Well, you know, it doesn't do that it, it, in no perfect way. And diabetics uh, who uh, have kidney failure, their chances of dying of heart disease are the greatest. You know, with a healthy diet, you can reduce their chances of dying of heart disease. And yet, you know, without a healthy diet, there's some of the most likely disease problems to die of heart disease. You'll also require less time on the dialysis machine. You know, instead of doing it maybe every day for several hours, maybe you could get down to two or three times a week. I think so. And there are some extra complications you have to deal with when you're dealing with the kind of diet I recommend and uh, kidney failure, like the potassium level in the food. You gotta be taught a low potassium diet. Phosphorus is also important. But the main issue as far as taking the workload on the, off the kidneys, off the body, is to, uh, is to feed a low protein, high carbohydrate diet. And for those of you who haven't progressed to the point of requiring dialysis, uh, my plea to you is get on the diet right now because on a healthy diet, you can slow or stop the progression of kidney disease of many kinds. Again, this has been shown over and over and over again. I've referenced uh, many of the studies for you in the book, McDougall's Medicine, A Challenging Second Opinion. So uh, yeah, it's uh, particularly important for healthy people to follow the kind of diet I recommend. You know that somebody who's healthy, AJ, they will lose 25% uh, of their kidney function by the time they reach 70 years of age, just from eating the normal American diet, the normal high protein American diet. But you know, that's okay. You don't notice anything because you've lost 25% of your kidney function. You only require 25% of kidney function to, to discharge all the waste, to be clinically well. So you don't take, have to require much kidney. So people don't notice this. The way it becomes important is when people have lost a considerable amount of kidney. For example, they've donated a kidney. I mean, the donor has cut their kidney function in half or they get in an auto accident or they suffer from diabetes or you know, some type of poisoning to the kidney system then uh, what happens is these people who have already compromised kidneys, the protein just raises havoc with them. It increases flows and pressures in the nephrons, which encourage the loss of kidney function. And if you aren't changed to a healthy diet, your loss of, of kidney tissue is dramatically increased. But by eating a good diet, a healthy diet, a high, high carbohydrate, which means of course a high starch diet, in a low protein diet, you can slow or stop the progression of kidney disease to stay off that dialysis machine. Nice. Uh, thank you, Dr. McDougall. And Richard, who's watching live says, Dr. McDougall, do you think there's a day that will come where there will be a cure for type one diabetes? Oh, this is, this is mostly science fiction for me. I mean, I've been told that we'd have, uh, you know, mechanical devices, uh, which will solve the problem. And I want to talk about this mechanical devices in a second, or some kind of transplant of stem cells or, you know, transplant of organs to a person with type one diabetes. But again, I have to say this is science fiction because in the 50 years I've been hearing this, nothing has really been accomplished. Now let's talk about the closest they've come to uh, replacing the pancreas. And that's by uh, glu continuous glucose monitoring. In other words, you have a sensor placed in or on your skin which determines your blood sugar level as often as every five minutes. And then following that, the uh, monitor may be connected to a pump. And then the pump uh, pumps in a prescribed amount of insulin based upon your blood sugar readings. Well, the, there's all kinds of problems associated with these pumps and complications and the cost. Uh, the, 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 the pump may cost as much as $5,000. The, uh, the materials you used in terms of the monitors have to be replaced quite frequently and they're expensive. And there's an increased risk of, uh, well, a whole, bunch, a whole bunch of problems. I'll tell you the, the biggest issue for me and people who are on uh, these pumps and these monitors, these continuous, uh, continuous evaluations and treatments, 
the biggest problem is, is that it destroys their life. Now, I try and get these people off of these, of this type of system as quick as possible. I mean, their lives are being destroyed. Think about what's going on. If you check the blood sugar as frequently as every five minutes, maybe you don't do it that often, but every time you do, everybody wants to know what's your blood sugar level. And so you talk about blood sugar level. And then the next question they have is how much insulin did you give yourself? And how are you feeling? Your whole life is spent focused on this machinery. You're not paying attention to the grandkids, your favorite book, your favorite friend. You know, it's all about this machine. So anyway, I, I take people off these uh, these monitors and pumps as quick as I can talk them into it. Of course, many people believe in high tech and so it's kind of hard sometimes. And of course, the other doctors promote this kind of Star Wars technology. But I try and do that. In most cases, I can get them off of the insulin pump and uh, get them on one shot of insulin a day, which is the Lantus insulin. And it, it may not end up as one shot a day, it may end up as two shots a day or two long acting shots a day and maybe some extra short acting insulin. I don't know. I mean, there are all kinds of ways to manage the problems, but I try and do it as simple as possible, which delivers the results that they're looking for, which is staying out of the hospital, keep from dying, feeling good. And as far as preventing complications, that has to do with what you eat. Yeah, what you eat, not how well you control your blood sugar level. It has to do with what you eat. In fact, I can show you that uh, aggressive control of blood sugar. I did show you, uh, but I can show you in type one diabetics, aggressive control of, of blood sugar causes hypoglycemia, which causes damage to the eyes and other tissues throughout the body. So I don't know how we got onto that question, but we did. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. And there's a question from Rebecca. Why does insulin cause people to gain weight? Well, because insulin's job is to open up the cells. It opens the cells, the, the regular cells in the body, it opens the cells so that sugar passes from the blood to inside the cell where it can be active. It also opens up the fat cells, the adipose tissue, the fatty cells, insulin opens them up and allows fat to get into the cells. So, that's why, as I showed you, aggressive treatment of diabetes resulted in an 18 pound weight gain as opposed to nine pounds. You can expect that if you're a type two diabetic, just like that lady I showed you on the scale, you can expect that you're gonna gain weight no matter how hard you try because you're on medications like insulin and many of the diabetic pills that increase your, your, the amount of insulin in your body or how, how uh, active the insulin is. You, you can expect to gain 20 pounds when you're started on medication, unless you take another approach, which is to follow a healthy diet. The one I recommend, a diet that is mostly starch with the addition of fruits and vegetables, and you reduce or stop the fat inducing drugs. You know, you just can't catch up with these medications uh, as been proven. So it's a dual approach. It's a, the healthy diet as well as sensible reduction in medications. Great. And Kathy says, how much starch is too much? I don't know how much starch is too much. I mean, I don't, I, I, I would be hard for me to imagine. But what I usually recommend is that when you look at your plate, by eyeballing, not by measuring, not by getting out a dietetic handbook and looking at the, the calorie content of various foods, is look at the plate. And 90% of the food you see on your plate is starch, pasta, breads, beans, potatoes, sweet potatoes, wheat, barley. I mean, I could go on and on and on. There must be a thousand different starches. Starches are high carbohydrate, high calorie parts of plants. And, uh, those, that should be 90% of your diet, as opposed to non-starchy plant foods, green and yellow vegetables. They may be the five or 10%. Non-starchy green and yellow vegetables would be things like uh, onions and celery and kale and broccoli and cauliflower. You can't make the bulk of your diet these, these uh, non-starchy green and yellow vegetables. You'll starve to death. You know, for me to get enough calories from cabbage, I'd have to eat uh, 
11 pounds of cabbage a day. I don't have that kind of time. So uh, just, just, just look at your plate. And besides that, you ought to feel good when you look at a plate of starch. You love starch. You know, pasta is comfort food. You know, all, all these soups, these vegetable soups that are starch-based, they're eye appealing. You know, enough. <laughs> nice. Uh, Sid sent in her question in advance, which we appreciate so much, viewers, when you do that. Dr. McDougal just sent out an email today titled, One Thing to Work On This Year, in which he suggested a gradual transition for people who don't want to change their diet all at once. That seems to be a turnabout. Is it correct that Dr. McDougal is now in favor of transition plans? No, Dr. McDougal is not in favor of transition plans. I, I don't know in what context that was said, but I think it was said to the point of this is that uh, you, you get results that are, that are proportional to the amount of change you make. And uh, if you're not ready to make the change 100%, then you know, any improvement will reap benefits. And you might as well get started. You, you, you are learning things, you're learning new foods, new, new shopping techniques, new ways to eat out if you still eat out in this world. You know, you're learning new things, but when it gets to the point where you say, I've had enough, you know, I'm tired of being fat and sick. I've had enough. And then you got to go 100%. You know, there's no room for moderation there. It is, uh, when you made the decision that you want your life back, then you just got to do it. You get the animal foods and the oils out and you put the potatoes and sweet potatoes and corn and rice, et cetera, the starches into the diet. And voila, I mean, the benefits are always there. You know, it's not like this sometimes work. This always works. This is a major change. Big key, big, big changes beget big results. We're a big deal. Do you want me to look? Hmm? You want me to look? What? At the um, email? No, I don't know. Okay. I okay. believe it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we love when you send the questions in advance, though, guys, we give them priority. And Deborah said that she loves the lectures that you're doing on my channel and was wondering, since you did a two part series on protein and the potato, would you ever consider doing a two part series on fat? No, I actually I actually have a four part series on fat. It's all ready to go. But, uh, you know, I got involved in this uh, McDougal's medicine thing, and I really wanted to put that out first. But yeah, it's already, it's already, it's in the can, so to speak. It's a lecture that I put together, which has way too many slides to give us one lecture. And I've divided into at least three segments, uh, the chemistry of fats and uh, how fats affect the body and the dietary treatment of a low fat diet. Those are the three parts. So it's ready. It's just a matter of fitting it in. When we get done with this series, maybe I'll do it. That sounds great, thank you. And Danny sent in a question. He lost 60 pounds being whole food plant-based, but now he's losing his hair and has thinning hair. I've heard that from people that have lost weight, they're saying that he's taking vitamin, uh, biotin, biotin, C, D, et cetera. Have you heard of people losing hair when they've lost weight? Women, you know, I've heard women say so, but otherwise I, I don't think it's related to the diet and, uh, at least uh, the kind of diet that we recommend. There's uh, a Dr. Naba, and you can find uh, his paper in uh, the McDougal program, 12 Days to Dynamic Health, which is a book you have still have to purchase. Uh, and in that, in that book, I talk about Dr. Naba's work. And the way I became familiar with Dr. Naba, which was a Japanese doctor, is uh, one of my friends who was a uh, a dermatologist, he found this article in uh, Oncology Dermatology, whatever magazine that is. And he, he brought it to me about Dr. Nava's work and I think he was just trying to tease me. It was titled, Can You Grow Your Hair Back? And uh, I started reading about uh, Dr. Nava's findings and he went through World War II and he pointed out that prior to the end of World War II, there was no male pattern baldness. And then after World War II and the change to a more Western diet, uh, male, part, male pattern baldness became more common, not as common as it is in the rest of the world in the Western diet, but it became more common. And then he explained how a change of diet affects your hormones, particularly your testosterone and how hair loss is related to testosterone. In fact, many of the treatments that are out there are to use anti-testosterone drugs. 
So once Dr. Inaba explained that, I figured he's got to be right. I was living in Hawaii at that time with Mary and we do a lot of uh, mingling with the, uh, the tourists and we see people come from Japan. And then of course we saw the native population of Hawaii of Japanese descent. And I quickly observed that the older gentleman from Japan who still maintained a rice-based diet had a beautiful set of hair. They were never bald. And whereas uh, my uh, Japanese descended patients who lived in Hawaii and switched to the Western diet, they were just as fat and greasy and bald as blacks and whites. And, you know, so, so, you know, just the opposite of what you're noting. However, I do note that in women, that whenever they change their hormones, like when they start the periods or they end their periods, menopause, or they get pregnant or they start breastfeeding or stop breastfeeding, end a pregnancy, but whenever they change their, uh, change their diet, what happens is they temporarily lose hair and they notice it on, on the brush and this stops. I've never seen anybody go bald, at least any woman go bald uh, as a consequence of losing a, a few hairs on their brush every day. So yeah, you know, and, but I think most of what, what this person is, is observing is just coincidental. You know, as you get older, if you happen to be on a high fat diet and you have a genetic tendency, you're gonna be losing hair. And you know, whatever happens to people when they're on a healthy diet, the kind of diet I recommend, it's a consequence of the diet. I mean, if you break a, if you drop a bowling ball on your foot, well, you know, I must've gotten confused because I ate all those starches and I dropped the bowling ball on my foot. Everything is due to the diet. Believe me, if you don't come to that conclusion, your mother-in-law will. Nice. Thank you. Here's a question about sugar that was sent in from Carol. She said, if you, could you please ask Dr. McDougall about my having regular sugar in my decaf coffee compared to using pureed dates or maple syrup? Is the regular sugar really that different in how my body reacts to it? Will I develop fatty liver from regular sugar? Well, you don't develop fatty liver from regular sugar. You develop fatty liver from eating a high fat American diet. So, uh, the answer is all these kinds of sugars are simple sugars. They're all similar. Take which whatever you prefer, whether it be maple syrup or brown sugar, or white sugar or molasses or whatever, agave. They're all simple sugars and whichever you prefer in, for, in terms of taste. But we use a little bit of sugar. We use it on the surface of the food. Why? Because it makes the food taste better and the goal is to get you to eat the food. You know, I've told you many times about the Mary Poppins movie, how they say a little bit of sugar makes the medicine go down. Well, if I've got to give you a little bit of sugar on the oatmeal to get you to eat the oatmeal, I'm going to do it. You made some good things this way. I, Mary made, made me just this wonderful dinner last night. And actually, she made it two nights ago, and I had it for two nights in a row. And I would have it again today. What is it, Mary? Well, um, we had this leftover tofu. Um, in the refrigerator and John said we better eat this before it expires and so I made two um, different concoctions of, of tofu mixture one was a, a Asian tofu sauce and one was a, a, another tofu sauce and <clears throat> the recipes are both in the um, the diet for a, a Diet for Diet our, health, healthy planet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Diet for a healthy planet. And so I made the the um, tofu, one in one pan and one in the oven. And, um, and then I made um, our fr favorite fried rice dish with um, already cooked rice in packages because I'm simple, you know. Not no oil. She <laughs> says fried. She just means yeah. looks like fried. And... Um, mixed up with uh, frozen vegetables and put it all together and then in divided it in half and added half of the one kind of tofu in into one of them and hand half of the other kind of tofu into the other and um 
They didn't taste that much well, different. You know, I, 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 you know, the extra firm had more of a meaty taste. Don't you know, bring, bring me back yeah. to my old days. Yeah, okay. But the soft tofu was really good. I, so I don't know which one I prefer, Mary. Yeah, I don't know if I would. I don't know if I but, would. But I, but I can tell you what I'm going to have for lunch today. <laughs> <laughs> Still some left over. But. That's fantastic. There's a question from a live viewer named Phil asking, after starting the starch solution, how long until the type 2 diabetic begins to see improvement? Immediately, they start to see improvement. Uh, first of all, when they stop their medications, they may see the blood sugar go up because the medications are suppressing the blood sugar. But over a short period of time, a matter of hours to days, what happens is the blood sugar starts to go down. Now, it may take, it may take a long time uh, for the blood sugars to become normal, particularly since the elevated blood sugar is related to being overweight, having too much fat in your system. It may, it may require you to lose all that extra weight to become a trim body weight. And I use uh, Walter Kempner's measurements on trim body weight, which I believe are in my... November 2016 newsletter, Kempner recommendations about what really trim weight is. And uh, if you get to that point and you're still having elevated blood sugar, you know, you're going to feel better. Uh, lots of the parts are going to start working again. The balls are going to be great. But say your blood sugar is still elevated uh, once you hit trim body weight, then I have to assume that you have partial pancreatic insufficiency, which is also known as type one and a half diabetes. In other words, uh, uh, you, you're not making enough insulin. The insulin is not uh, working at the cellular level. You have insulin insensitivity. Yeah. And if that's the case, if you have type one and a half diabetes and you have insulin insufficiency, partial pancreatic insufficiency, then I know how to treat that. If you develop, you develop side effects, like too much weight loss, I know, I know, never lose too much weight, but you could. <laughs> You could, and um, if you develop extra excessive thirst and urination, or if people around you are worried about it, you know, I, I'll prescribe insulin for you, and I do it commonly. I, you know, will prescribe insulin, and I'll prescribe a long-acting insulin, like Lantus, and it works out well. It works out really well. The type one and a half diabetics, what they have to do is they have to take a one shot, 10, 20 units of Lantus uh, before they go to bed in the evening. That's it. Boom. The rest of the day is free to enjoy the kids, to work at your occupation, you know, your fun and games, your friends and family. Not being tied to being a diabetic. It's just, you know, being sick and, and focusing your whole life on your sickness and your treatments. It's not how you want to be. You want to be well. You don't want to spend your time figuring out which pills you're going to take today. You don't want to have your calendar littered with doctor's appointments and an occasional hospitalization. That's, that's not living. Sick people take drugs. Sick people have checkerboard abdomen secondary to their surgeries. Healthy people don't do that. You wanna enter a category of healthy so your life can get back to your own, you know, to enjoying yourselves, not being a sick person. And even if you can't accomplish 100%, uh, doing the right thing will alleviate so much of the burden of your illness and your treatments. It's all so simple. Uh, Lauren wants to know, is it ever safe for a diabetic to drink moderately, meaning alcohol? Oh, uh, you know, that gets into a whole nother subject. Uh, let's see, alcohol, you know, we talked about alcohol. Alcohol does not turn into fat. It's just too, too metabolically expensive for it to do that. What alcohol does is it, uh, with moderate drinkers, it causes uh, a lack of inhibition. What happens is uh, instead of one potato chips, it becomes two bags of potato chips. You're no longer inhibiting your behavior because you've had a couple of drinks. That's, that's where alcohol really causes the problem. Plus the body would rather burn alcohol than it would fat. So it leaves fat in the fat cells. So in that way, you're going to not lose as much weight consuming alcohol. But Ladies and gentlemen, if you stop and think about it, drunks, serious alcoholics are always stealth thin. Modern drinkers, not so. 
Yep. I, I heard of a new study out of the UK that's showing that even um, what, the, what they're saying is moderate drinking, like one drink a day leads to cognitive decline. This is a new study that I, I just saw. Very interesting. Well, that, that'll probably ruin a lot of people's days because we <laughs> love to hear good news about our bad habits. Yep. So true. So true. There's a question from Jeff. Any concerns with stevia? Will you address that, Mary? Well, stevia is um, a leaf that is ground up and it. It's a very sweet leaf. And so it's used as a, uh, a sugar substitute. And, but we have, we used it at the program for a long time um, to stay away from sugar. But we found out that too many people were having um, bowel problems or um, intestinal problems um, or a lot of gas and bloating. And we narrowed it down to the stevia. And so we stopped using it and we don't use it anymore just for that reason. Great, thank you. Uh, Janice says, did he say pasta is healthy food? It's processed. Well, it is, but remember Walter Kempner's diet was made of white rice. <laughs> you know, I, I think you need, to, you need to fight your battles where it's most important. A whole grain pasta is going to be healthier than a highly refined pasta. And there are a lot of whole grain pastas out there. And there are a lot of non-wheat pastas and rice pasta, is, brown rice pasta is great. And then when you, you know, as opposed to bread, where you, where, which is dry, when you cook pasta, you cook it with water and it absorbs a lot of the water and therefore decreases the calorie density. But, uh, you, you know, you're right. It's healthier to eat the wheat berry than to eat the, the pasta or the bread, but it's not all that bad. I mean, you're still going to get well. Still going to lose the excess weight if you include breads and bagels. Well, I wouldn't. I don't know about the bagels, but certainly <laughs> breads and pastas. They they somehow engineer those bagels. Well, so they're, they're so dense. Yeah, they're so much denser than a loaf of bread. I mean, it's a, yeah. They don't get soft at all. So it, you know, I don't know. They just seem seem in, more dense. In an ideal world, you will eat <laughs> no refined food. Okay, I mean, I'm not saying that casually. And some of you, it'll be required that for you to get well, to eat no refined food, to lose the extra weight, no refined food. So what you brought up is an important principle, but you know, in a, in a world where I just want you to get well, I just want you to succeed. I just want you to get your life back. You know, I'm willing to make some, some compromises in a sense, not, not that would compromise your health, but maybe your idealistic attitude about different uh, different subjects related to food. You know, we're, we're willing to put a little salt and sugar on the surface of your food because it tastes better. I mean, if you're not enjoying the diet that we recommend, put some salt on the surface of the food, It'd be great. That'll solve the problem. Uh, same thing with spices. I mean, there's some negative things about spices, but they may make the food more familiar to you and put it on the surface of their food. Uh, refined products. Well, you know, it's better to eat a whole grain pasta and a whole grain bread. I'm not kidding. Uh, we have, you know, white pasta and white bread, not so good. Not so good. But, you know, as I've talked to you about is feeding white bread to moderately overweight college students for two months. They had to eat 12 slices of bread a day. Uh, the, average, the average weight loss on white bread was 14 pounds. The average weight loss on brown bread which I assume is more whole grain bread, was 19 pounds. Just adding the 12 slices of bread a day to their, to their regular regime. They weren't told to eat less pizza or you know, less fried pork chops, fewer fried pork chops. They weren't told to do that. They were just told to eat the bread. You gotta eat the bread. Anyway, uh, you're right. Refined products are not, are, are not the best for you. And uh, you, ought to, you ought to certainly keep that in mind but in the real practical world, if you include uh, a reasonable amount, what's a reasonable amount of these refined products, you do pretty good. Remember Walter Kempner, white rice, fruit, fruit juice, and simple sugar. The, the best results of anybody I have ever seen practicing any kind of medicine 
have been those that have been accomplished by Walter Kepner's rice diet. And uh, he's discussed in my, uh, I told you my December 2013 newsletter. An another one of my mentors, uh, Dennis Burkett is in my January 2013 newsletter and Nathan Pritikin's in my February 2013 newsletter and Roy Swank, who was the head of neurology at uh, Oregon Health and Science University for 23 years, is discussed all over my website. Just put his name in, in the search engine and you will find my four mentors. I don't think it's the bread that's the problem. I think it's the peanut butter that people put on the bread. <laughs> and you know, uh, yeah. You know, it, the, the thing is, is that when you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you've compounded the problems. Uh, you have, uh, you, you've added the sugar with the jelly which raises the insulin levels, sugar does that. And you provided the fat in the form of peanut butter. So you've got the insulin around to drive the fat into fat cells. So there's an argument that making the combination is a double whammy when you eat uh, things that are high fat, high sugar, which is pretty much everything out there that's made in terms of desserts, high fat, high sugar. You're not kidding. There's a question from Graham. Oh my God, it just went away because my chat goes so fast. It was basically for a type two diabetic, do you recommend any supplements or anything else in addition to the diet? No, no, I, you know, I, I don't recommend supplements. Supplements in terms of vitamins and minerals are dangerous. They increase your risk of dying, heart disease, cancer. Don't take these vitamin and mineral supplements. And that includes uh, vitamin D, which increases your risk of falls and fractures. You should not be taking these. Now, if you mean supplements in terms of natural medicines like Saul Paul Metal and St. John's Wort, that's different. These are natural medicines. They're not what I would call supplements. They don't supplement anything. They're used to treat. <clears throat> They're natural drugs to treat. But people often get those confused. When they say supplements, they say, well, you know, are you, are you talking about some kind of herbal preparation that I buy in the, in the supermarket or health food store. No, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about supplements in terms of supplementing your body with vitamins and minerals, because somehow or another you don't have enough in them. You should consume these uh, vitamins and minerals in their natural packages, earthy fruits and vegetables. But you do recommend B12 though, right? Dr. McDougall, if somebody's vegan. I, I do, I do. But you know, just like with any medication that I recommend, I, I reserve the right to change my opinion. And I've written two articles that are on my website on vitamin B12 and uh, wrote one quite recently. And uh, you'll see in there that I still recommend B12. <clears throat> B12 is the only vitamin supplement that I recommend and B12 was the last uh, vitamin discovered. And uh, B12 is made by bacteria. So we used to consume a lot more bacteria than we used to in the form of uh, bacteria on the roots of plants and bacteria on the kitchen table left by the chickens. <laughs> so we used to get a lot, of, a lot more bacteria than we did before. And maybe that's why there've been fewer than 10 cases of- Remember all the guinea pigs that used to run around the, the kitchen in the, um, oh, in the huts in Peru? There's a big B12 source, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, anyway, the, um, I, I do recommend vitamin B12, and, but I reserve the right to change my opinion about it. There was just an article, well, let's not get into that. Just take your B12. <laughs> you don't have to take it very often. Uh, and the dose is extremely small, smaller than you're ever gonna be able to find in the store. You'll be able to find 500 or 5,000 microgram pills you need 0 0.05. So you don't have to take it every day. No, you can take it once a week, once a month. Now, when was the last time we remembered to take it? I think a couple oh, of days yeah, ago. A couple of days ago, yeah. you remembered. <laughs> what I do is, you know, as I'm rummaging through the, 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 the cabinet looking for my razor or something, I find the B12 <clears throat> and I lay it out there for Mary to take it. And so whenever that happens, then we take our B12. But um, I, I recommend that you take it uh, daily and probably weekly would be okay. And I make that as a serious recommendation because I don't want to be uh, the doctor who causes B12 deficiency in somebody. If I did, you know, I've had trouble getting noticed over the last 50 years 
But I'll tell you, I, I create one case of B12 deficiency, say a, 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 a easily reversible anemia or tingling of somebody's toes and fingers. And I'd hit front page headlines. You know, vegan diet or McDougal diet causes B12 deficiency. Front page headlines, why? Because people like to hear good news about their bad habits. Ah, I know I don't have to eat all these plants. I need to get my B12. Well, your risk of B12 deficiency is less, as a disease is less than one in a million. Your risk of a heart attack is one in two. You know, breast cancer, one in seven. Prostate cancer, one in six. Type two diabetes, uh, probably one in eight. Uh, Pre-diabetes, one in two. Obesity, yeah, I don't know. I have to calculate the percentage there. I mean, it looks like 80% of the people out there walking the streets are overweight or obese. You know, certainly 40% are obese. It, it, it just, doesn't it just blow your mind, particularly if you're a trim, healthy person to go into a public place and to look around you and everybody in a shopping center, everybody is overweight. And many people are, it's, it's obese. It's, it's just, it's abnormal to be trim these days. Yep. Uh, Faith says, if you've been diagnosed with low vitamin D, then what about supplementing with D? No, you should not supplement with D. Uh, what you should do is you should, uh, remember this is the sunshine vitamin. You should get more sunshine. That would help. The other thing you do is you have to fix your chronic diseases like uh, obesity and diabetes and so on because uh, people who suffer from these uh, chronic dietarily caused illnesses, uh, it results in inflammation. You know, the, the foods injure the tissues and as a result, you get inflammation. And one of the byproducts of inflammation is a substance that lowers your, your vitamin D levels in your bloodstream. So artificially, your vitamin D levels are low caused by not lack of sunshine, not lack of supplements, but being, being chronically ill. You can fix it. You don't do what people have been doing for a million years. Walk around the sun, take your clothes off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Sh Sherry asks, can you reverse the damage of the pancreas due to high glucose? Mm. I think what she's asking is, can you reverse type one diabetes? The answer is no. Once the cells are gone, they're dead. However, you do have a honeymoon period where uh, you, the person initially appears to be diabetic and then they seem to get well. Well, that's a healing process that goes on in the progression to total destruction of the, the beta cells. You get this honeymoon period. I, I hope that if you were to catch the problem before all the cells were lost during this honeymoon period and you remedied the situation, in other words, you stopped the, the dairy products, you ate a healthy diet like I recommend, that you'd end up with some pancreatic, pancreatic function being left. But how many people do that? And how many people are told by their doctor that type one diabetes is caused by molecular mimicry between 17 amino acids that are shared by your beta cells, your pancreas and cow's milk. <laughs> ah, really folks, published in 1992 and you know, no response. The problem is, is that there's no reason to respond in the sense there's no reason for somebody to make money by telling you the truth. That's the problem. Yep. So th there was a question, or there is a question from, where did my screen go? Sorry. Uh, it was, can you please explain what metabolic syndrome is? Well, metabolic syndrome is from poisoning from the, uh, from the, the foods on the American diet. And classically, you're overweight, you have uh, uh, prediabetes, you have high triglycerides, it's, it's a combination of things that happen as a result of eating unhealthy food. And they've uh, listed this combination of symptoms all together and they've called it metabolic syndrome. It's food poisoning. That's what it is. It's, you know, because when you correct the food poisoning by eating the diet that we recommend, your metabolic sy syndrome goes away. You lose the weight, your triglycerides come down, your blood sugar improves, et cetera. You know, it's just a made up name to, uh, you know, to 
identify a common group of signs and symptoms. And uh, it's called metabolic syndrome. N nothing special, it's food poisoning. Great, thank you. Wow. So you're sold out for January. The next chance people have would be your February program. That's what they tell me. Uh, we're sold out. Yeah, we, you know, there's a reason for that, AJ. And that is that we run a really, really good program. And people are telling their friends and neighbors, uh, family about, about the program, how, how much they benefited. Uh, we have a lot of people who have been through the residential program, and which we've run residential programs for 34 years. And uh, we've had people who've come through the St. Helena Hospital program and the resort-based program we ran in Santa Rosa, California. And then they attend the, the, the internet program, the telemedicine, telehealth program. And I can't think of a single person who's weighed on the side of the residential program. They've all said this is far better. And our results show it. We get better weight losses. We get uh, uh, better compliance. So it is just an easy way to do it. And the reason is, is because people are left in their home environment to do this. It's not like you fly off to a resort and you know, spend $10,000 doing it. And then you go home to your, to your own kitchen and you've all of a sudden got to do it. Uh, you do it right there alive with us, with our support, you know, making suggestions for you, telling you where to find things and helping you through the medical issues like, you know, how much insulin should I take today? Or can I stop my blood pressure pills today? We've got a doctor there working all the time on helping you manage your medical issues. And, you know, sometimes I get referred for difficult <laughs> patients. <laughs> Not really. You do. Yeah, once in a while I get to see a patient. I really miss seeing patients. I used to see 60 patient, patients a program. And I, I loved seeing every one of them. And I don't get to see as many people as I used to. And I guess that's okay, because I'm busy doing a lot of other things like preparing these lectures. But uh, sometimes when there's a, a difficult issue that comes on, uh, they call in the old guy, <laughs> the old timer. What, is, what does he know that might, might be able to help? And you know, it really works out well for me and for everybody. It is the 12 day internet-based telemedicine. In other words, there's a doctor there to care for you. Telehealth, in other words, uh, all the education supports you need. Program that we run every month. Take advantage of it. It's about one third of the cost it would cost you to go to the residential program that we ran for so many years. Great. A lot of people are saying they live in places where the sun doesn't shine. Well, you know, if that's the case, then you get a, a light box. You know, you get a, a, a what do they call them, tanning booths or? or uh, I think they call them um, light boxes actually no not tanning they don't call them for, for mm -hmm. they're they're kind of shaped like they're uh they kind of go over you you lay yeah. down and they, well they yeah they're they're sort of um whatever they whatever you call them these days folks tanning salons whatever you call them uh, i think they're called light but you, boxes. you can you can uh, you know when you say light box i think about the box that you use to treat depression oh whereas okay. you know you kind of sit there in front of your desk and you you got this uh, light coming in that simulates the visual spectrum that oh, releases depression. Right. Okay. Whereas this other one, this tanning booth, uh, this the artificial sunshine, you, you can buy them and plug it into the wall and you get sunshine. You could do that. Uh, you could also take a vacation. Your vitamin D levels all year long are reflected by how you spent your summer vacation. So a couple of weeks of sunshine will last you all year long. You could do that or you could start uh, taking some time off of uh, your busy schedule. You get out in the sun. How much do you need? Well, a, a white person like myself needs uh, five minutes of sunshine exposure on my face and the back of my hands at noon at the latitude of Boston, three times a week in the spring, summer and fall. That's all, you don't need much. Now, darker people, like, for example, Asians, and I know I'm generalizing here, three times as much sunshine. A, a, a black person, 10 times as much sunshine. It depends on the variation of, of intensity of the pigment in your skin. The pigment is there to protect you from sunshine. That's why uh, you are more pigmented if you're 
family came from a place near the equator. And if your family has its roots in places that are of high latitude, you know, say upper Canada or Southern Australia, then what happens is uh, you are white, you've lost the pigments so that the sun can get into your skin and cause the production of vitamin D. It's all so natural. It's all so simple. <laughs> Don't take pills. Don't take pills. Don't take vitamin D shots. They're dangerous. Every study I'm aware of that where you take 2,000 international units or more show that you have an increased risk in falls and fractures. And there's lots of research that says even taking smaller doses gets you in the same kind of trouble. Why? Because these supplemental vitamin D sources cause imbalances at the cellular level of your nerves and your muscles. So you fall fracture. Don't do it. Get some sunshine. Well, people in these cold climates without sun are asking if the light box still helps you make the vitamin D through the skin. Well, no, a light box wouldn't do it. See, when I say light box, I think about something you use for seasonal affective disorder. You know, it may all be terminology. You know, I think, think of a tanning booth as uh, something that provides the spectrum of sunshine that causes you to sunburn, causes production of vitamin D. So they're, they're in my mind, there are two different types of setups. You can buy them on Amazon, and they just describe exactly what they're what they're for. Yeah, yeah. And so then, you know, they'll tell you this is for sunshine, um, and the other one is for seasonal SAD. Yeah. SAD. Anyway, uh, I, I don't. You know, you can you certainly you can get burnt by these tanning beds. So be careful. <laughs> Uh, Kathy says, aren't you concerned about the arsenic in rice? No, I'm not concerned about the arsenic in rice. Do I need to go through that story again? Okay, I will. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it was a consumer's report uh, that came out. By the way, this is discussed in, on my website. You just put in arsenic and the article I wrote will come up. Uh, consumer report they identified as, uh, as a high arsenic food, rice. And uh, the previous year they've... Uh, published a review of fruit juices, which showed more arsenic in fruit juices, but that didn't have, he had national headlines like uh, the rice scandal did. And uh, yes, rice accumulates arsenic. But where's the arsenic come from? It comes from previous farming. It comes from Louisiana where they used to grow cotton. And the cotton was infested with boll weevils to kill the boll weevils, what you used was arsenic, which got into the soil. And now you come by and instead of cotton, you plant rice. Well, what do you think's gonna happen? So what I would search out as I would search out uh, producers that claim that their rice has been tested and it's lower in arsenic. You know? And you know, you, you know some places where- Well, um, we, we fairly much trust Lundberg it's over on the East Coast where they didn't plant as much cotton, whereas on the West Coast. Yeah. And so we protect. Um, we think they're pretty we, Lundberg farms. We think they're. We think they're Lundberg. They make all different, all different kinds. And and rice produced in other countries. I've, yeah, I was I've just going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, I love rice, and I'm not even afraid. A lot of people are afraid to eat white rice, but. I'm not. You, you know, uh, AJ, uh, I've never seen a case of arsenic poisoning, but I've seen a lot of cases of, uh, of meat and dairy poisoning and oil poisoning. So, you know, and rice cures the, the meat and the dairy poisoning, the oil poisoning. Anyway, I think it's something you should be aware of and take some steps towards. It's not a good idea to, to consume arsenic. Uh, I, I wanna tell you, if you're worried about toxic heavy metals uh, like thallium and cesium, and I mean, things that are known as killers. And you want to stay away from cruciferous vegetables. You know, your cabbage and your, your broccoli. And you want to, because they're hyper accumulators of these toxic metals. I mean, they really suck up the, the poisons. And by the way, you can find that article by going to the website and putting in hyper accumulators probably, or cruciferous vegetables, or maybe both. 
but it'll pop up for you, the article I wrote on that particular topic. Great. Um, Shar says, how do you feel about time-restricted feeding? I assume that's like eating for 15 minutes as opposed to an hour. Is that right? Well, I think it's like when, like they call it intermittent fasting, where like you're narrowing the feeding window and maybe to like eating only eight hours a day instead of 12 or longer. Sounds painful. <laughs> Sounds like something I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to waste my time uh, even putting it on my daily planner. I don't know. I, I don't, th I don't think it matters what time of the day you eat. It doesn't matter a lot how many times a day you eat, but people who are grazers, nibblers, they do better than people who are gorgers. You know, I don't think it matters uh, what time of the day you eat. I think what's important is what you eat. And I say this realizing there are a lot of people who are shift workers. In other words, they work all night long. And uh, <clears throat> their free time is... Uh, is uh, well, they spend their time sleeping during the day and their meals are at night. Uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't think you should be focusing on these kind of peripheral recommendations. The problem is the, is, is the food. It's, it's the kind of food you eat. You need to switch to a starch-based diet. I hope you're getting, I, ho I hope uh, that AJ and I have worked hard enough and Mary putting her uh, comments about tasty foods uh, so that you've done it, you've realized that this is the truth. It works. I don't. I don't have any concern about you coming back to me and saying what I, what I, what you recommended me do for me to do, didn't work. I'm not worried about that a bit. You know, and I also am accepting the fact that you're going to come back to me and say, what you recommended was difficult, and I just couldn't do it this time. Well, my response will be, well, let's keep trying. You know. You're learning something new about yourself and about the food every time you quote fail. Let's just keep working on it. Eventually you're gonna get it. Just like for me, it took me 12 different experiences to finally quit smoking cigarettes. I had to learn different things. Uh, I had to learn that you don't date women who smoke cigarettes. <laughs> I, I think I was, off, I was off cigarettes for several months before I met this lady. Anyway, uh, it, I, it took me a while to learn that once you quit smoking cigarettes, you can't start again. I would often fool myself by saying, well, it's been 11 days since I haven't smoked, suffered every one of those days. I just had one, just one. And, you know, what's the big deal, just one? I'll tell you, every alcoholic, every, every heroin user, every tobacco user, and lo most of you who are, who are food habituated, you just can't have one piece of chocolate cake. It just doesn't ever stops. So once you realize that that's normal behavior and you can guard against it, uh, then you, you, you do it hundred percent. Well said, thank you so much. Um, I don't see any more questions. So we know you're coming back in two weeks. You're gonna be talking about heart disease and hypertension. Is that what I have scheduled? That's what you have scheduled. So it's, it's going to be in two weeks from today, which is the 17th of January. I think yeah. that's Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday celebrated. And hopefully we'll have another surprise guest for you that's going to give a, a testimonial because there's certainly so many out there. I can tell you, AJ, I'm, I'm just looking at it now. In two weeks, I'm probably going to spend every day for the next two weeks getting this lecture ready. I uh, hope it showed how much effort I put into it. Yeah, I, I was, I felt like I was at a conference. I'm like, this is so good. I mean, we're so blessed because it was, it's like, it's the kind of caliber that you get, like if you're going to get a CEUs at a conference. Oh, good. I'm glad you see it that way. I hope I make, made some very difficult subjects understandable. And you have the, you have the video there so you can go back and rewatch it. And you can look at the slides. There's a lot of extra information on the slides. You can look at the references and you can look up the scientific studies, see whether or not I exaggerated, whether it's really true what I told you. And you can always challenge your healthcare providers, nurses and doctors and other people involved in your healthcare. You can challenge them with what I said. You know, hey, watch the lecture Dr. McDougall gave on diabetes. See if that's true. Or hey, Dr. McDougall gave a really good lecture on breast cancer, which is, completely contradictory to what you're recommending for me. Tell me why he's wrong. You know, really folks, I don't mind being challenged. I hate being ignored. 
Yeah, you've said that. I'd rather be hated than ignored. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, no one could ignore you. Thank you so much, Dr. Oh, thanks, Mugu. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much, Larry and Ann Weed. I know they're still watching. It was such a pleasure catching up with you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time when my guest is Dr. Paul Giles. Take care, everyone. Bye.